Hey guys, welcome back. So in this video, we'll be looking at the sigmoid function. And whether you're here because you just need to learn the sigmoid function for a class, or whether you're here because you want to really get into the heart of machine learning and data science, I want to start this discussion not from the mathematics or the formula that defines the sigmoid function, but rather from why do we care about it at all? Why did people put so much thought into developing the sigmoid function if there are simpler things out there? So with that in mind, let's start with a real world setup so that everything we say going forward can be a little bit more applicable. So we're gonna start from here. Let's say that you're a data scientist for the education system. And the current thing you're working on is developing a model which is going to predict whether or not a high schooler will drop out of high school. And this is gonna be some function of all their past academic performance. The point of this video really is not the model. But let's say you've built such a model and the model in the end outputs some score S, which is between negative infinity and infinity. So it's just unbounded in both directions. But what you do know is that the higher the score is, so the more towards positive infinity the score is, the higher evidence we have that this current student will indeed drop out of high school. And conversely, the lower the score is, so the more towards minus infinity, the more evidence we have that the student will not drop out. Now currently the score being kind of unbounded is not super helpful in comparing one student with another. So the goal throughout this video is going to be converting the score, which is again between negative infinity and infinity, just some unbounded real number, is going to be mapping that to a probability p, where probabilities of course have to be bounded between zero and one. The reason we want to do this is because of, mostly because of interpretability, because now we can say, okay, given that the model outputs this score, we can map that to a probability, and that'll tell us what's the probability or the likelihood that this student will drop out. If that likelihood is very high, like 95%, then we can send many resources to that student to hopefully help them not drop out. If that probability is more like 2%, maybe we don't need to worry so much about those kind of students. So that's the motivation. Now, the first natural thing we might do is just draw a straight line. So well, while I did say here that the score is bounded between negative infinity and infinity, of course, if we consider some finite set of students when training our model, our score is gonna be between two bounds. So let's say when we train our model, our scores are between negative 10 and 10. So our goal is to map this range between negative 10 and 10 to the range zero to one. And the easiest thing would be just draw this blue line that I've drawn. So the student who has a negative 10 score, that gets mapped to zero, and the student who got a positive 10 score gets mapped to one, and anything in between just gets mapped linearly. Now this is a very natural thing to do, and it has some advantages in terms of simplicity, but it's not the best choice. And here's two big reasons why. The first big reason is purely just mathematical. For example, let's say that we choose to use this model, and in the future we get a student who, when we put them through the model, they get a score of 20, or negative 15. Our linear model would basically just map that out of bounds, something that's less than zero or greater than one. So that's no longer interpretable as a probability. So it seems kind of weird to do that. And perhaps the bigger issue, which is issue number two, is that the rate of change of this linear function doesn't really capture the heart of this probabilistic setup. And here's what I mean by that more concretely. So this linear function is pretty much just increasing at the same rate throughout all time. But let's pause for a second and really think about what it means for the score to be around zero versus something positive versus something very negative. If the score is around zero, and that maps to the probability of one half, let's say, that means that we basically are, have a 50-50 shot whether this student is going to drop out or not drop out. So we have basically zero information. Now let's say the score goes from zero up a little bit to one. That's a big deal because going from a score of zero to a score of one is a huge change in relative terms. So because of that huge change in score in relative terms, we would expect the probability to spike or jump by a lot. So the shape we're looking for here is not a line, but something more like this. We want the probability to spike for this zero to one change. And symmetrically in the other direction, if the score goes from zero to negative one, that's again a really huge change in relative terms. So we expect the probability to dip by a lot. So we want this kind of shape if that were to happen. So we see already linear functions not capturing that. Now to round out the story, let's say the score were happening to be nine. And let's say I said it went from nine to 10. Now that's not a huge change in relative terms. A more human way to think about that is saying, 
I have a student whose score is nine. So basically I'm saying I have very, very high evidence that they're going to drop out. And now I said, what if their score were 10? Well, I still have a pretty high evidence. Things haven't changed all that much. So another way of saying that mathematically is that when we get out here to the boundaries of our function, we're expecting the probability not to change by much for these uh, equal changes in score. So we're kind of expecting it to be flat over here. And if I were to connect this guy to this guy, we get this kind of shape. And the exact same story over here. Jumping from a score of negative 9 to negative 10 is really not changing much in terms of our probability of the student dropping out. So we're going to have this sort of shape in the end for our function. And this black line I've drew here, this black curve, is exactly what's called a sigmoid. It solves these two problems. Note it solves the first problem because the sigmoid is inherently bounded between 0 and 1. Even if I were to send the score over to a billion, it's obviously going to be pretty much 1, but the sigmoid never actually touches 1 or touches 0. So it always stays bounded no matter what the score would happen to be. So that solves problem number 1. And more importantly, it solves problem number 2, which is that it exactly captures this, this setup where if we have no information where the score would be equal to 0, let's say, then little changes in the score have big impacts on our probability. But if we already have a lot of information in either direction, the same amount of change in score is really not going to change anything at all. So that's why we use this thing called the sigmoid. Now that we have the motivations in our heads, let's go ahead and jump to the mathematics. So it turns out that the thing I drew is described by this uh, mathematical formula, where the probability given the score is equal to 1 over 1 plus e, e being Euler's number, 2.7, whatever, e to the power of negative s. Let's do a very quick sanity check to make sure that the curve I drew matches to the function that I wrote. Let's say s were equal to positive infinity, then the bottom of this fraction would be basically going to 1 plus 0, and that would be 1. So that matches up to the fact that if I go to positive infinity, the function, the sigmoid, should be 1. If s were equal to negative infinity, the denominator goes to infinity, so the entire fraction goes to 0, which is exactly what we want on this end. And the last sanity check is if I plug in s is equal to 0, so the score is exactly 0, meaning I have uh, no information one way or the other, this probability should be 1 half. Indeed, if I put in 0 in s, I get 1 plus 1 on the bottom, so the entire fraction becomes 1 half. So that is the correct formulation for this curve. Now to just close out this video, I want to touch on the derivative of the sigmoid because it ends up being really, really important for when we look at neural networks, other machine learning applications. Um, and if you're just here just to kind of get an idea of the sigmoid, you can just follow the mathematics. But if you're more trying to get into the heart of machine learning, we care about the derivative of the sigmoid because it's used to calculate loss functions, which basically help us train our machine learning models. Either way, this is the derivative of the sigmoid. So it would be dp ds, p being the probability, s being the score. So you can work out for yourself that this is the derivative. I'll go through the high level steps with you. Um, this is our function. We're going to be interpreting it as 1 plus e to the negative s all to the power of negative 1. So we use the power rule to bring that negative 1 into the front, which technically it is here, but you'll see why it goes away. The negative 1 comes in the front. Then we put a power of negative 2, so that is why we get 1 plus e to the negative x squared. We use chain rule to take the derivative of the lower part, which gives us e to the negative s. And of course, the negative s is why we end up with a positive sign in the front. So this is the derivative, the first derivative of the sigmoid. Now, can we reduce this into something that's a little bit easier to work with? Yes, and that's the key insight why people continuously use the sigmoid because of its really nice derivative property we're about to see. So I can split this guy up into the multiplication of two terms. So the first one is 1 over 1 plus e to the negative s, and the other is e to the negative s over 1 plus e to the negative s. The reason I did this is if you stare at this guy, this is exactly p, p of s itself. So that's p. And this guy is actually 1 minus p. You can do a very quick mathematical expression to check that for yourself. So what that basically says is that the derivative of the sigmoid with respect to s, the score, is actually p, the probability, times 1 minus p, which is a very nice form. And not just is it a nice form, it also has a great intuitive explanation. For example, let's consider three cases to close this video out. Let's say that your probability was already very high. So your score is very high and your probability was near 1. If your probability is near 1, you plug in 1 into here and you get that the derivative ends up being 0. 
Does that intuitively make sense? Yes, because if your probability was already very high, which means your score was also very high, then a small change in your score is basically going to change your probability by zero. Basically, you already have so much evidence that the student is going to drop out that a little change in the score doesn't change anything. Same thing for the other side. Let's say that your probability was zero, which means your score was very negative, which basically says that you're very, very sure the student's not going to drop out. If you change the score a little bit, that doesn't change the story. And the last case to consider before we close the video is what if the probability was a half, which means we have exactly no information to help us with this problem. We're equally certain the student will or will not drop out. Well, then we actually get this function to achieve its highest value, which is one fourth, because one half times one half is one fourth. And that makes sense because that's exactly when the probability would be changing the most. Another way to say that is, let's say that I have zero information whether or not the student's going to drop out. Then you change my score by a little bit. Let's say you increase my score by a little bit. That gives me a ton of information, which is basically the same story as the sigmoid jumping very fast in the beginning. Therefore, my derivative is going to be very, very high. So hopefully, that helps you understand the sigmoid very deeply, not just at a surface numerical level, but at a level of why do people choose to use it? Why is it used so much in machine learning? And if you have any questions at all, please feel free to leave them in the comments below. Like and subscribe for more videos just like this, and I will see you guys next time.